it's understood that from time to time an angel of the Lord comes and stirs the water. And once that water is disturbed, whoever gets into the water first gets cured of their ailments. So Jesus shows up, and of all the people around this pool, he takes special interest in one man who has been there and ill for 38 years. And from this point on, his life has changed forever. I would ask you to stand out of respect for the gospel. Soon, another feast came around, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the, near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, do you want to get well? The sick man said, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. Jesus said, get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. That day happened to be the Sabbath. The Jews stopped the healed man and said, it's the Sabbath, you can't carry your bedroll around, it's against the rules. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So last weekend, we, I hope most of us, were partaking in faith in action. On uh, Saturday night, there was no worship in the chapel, and on Sunday morning, there was no worship in the sanctuary, but between 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, we had hundreds of people show up to find out which bus they were supposed to get on, to go out to one of our four core initiatives or the surrounding neighborhoods and do some wonderful service work. I had the opportunity to go to Kingdom House, and I had the opportunity to meet members of our church that I hadn't met before, visitors to our church who regularly come for Faith in Action that I hadn't met before, a couple of people who work at Kingdom House that I hadn't met before. It was terrific. And during the time while I was there, a post-dispatch reporter was there, and apparently another one was at a couple of the other uh, agencies. And by Monday morning, there was a wonderful article in the Post-Dispatch, and I hope that most of you saw it. It was a, a really good article about what we were doing. There were some great um, uh, interviews with a couple of the executive directors of the agencies, but also with members of our church. It was really delightful and a wonderful way to cap off a great experience. So on Tuesday, I was in the office, and uh, a phone call came through, and Christy, who is our receptionist, took the phone call. And uh, it was a woman who said that she had seen the article in the Post-Dispatch. She, she prefaced what she wanted to share with the fact that she has no connection with Manchester United Methodist Church. And then she wanted to make sure that Christy knew she had an advanced degree and she really knew her Bible. And I said, did you brace yourself when you heard that? I would. I would brace myself. Okay. What this woman had to say was that we were setting a dangerous precedent by canceling worship services on Sunday morning. And then went on to tell why she felt this was the case. And every time Christy tried to share with her a little bit about how this really was uh, viewed as Sabbath time and worship time for us, the woman just talked over her. And the last thing this woman said was, your church, you thumbed your nose at the Bible because God said, you can't work on Sunday. And that was pretty much the end of the conversation. It didn't matter that as a church, we were out there loving God and neighbor and worshiping God through service, and we were very conscientious about that. Christy, throughout this conversation, tried to reassure her of all the good that had taken place on that day, and the woman just wouldn't stop talking. She was incensed because we had, from her perspective, broken a rule. We had broken a rule. And she had absolute tunnel vision about that. That is all that she could see. It didn't matter what Christy said. Nothing else mattered. All else was moot because we had broken a rule. Projects completed and relationships built didn't matter. She could not grasp the holiness of the day. She was blind to everything but that rule that she felt we broke and could see nothing else. 
Christie realized not too far into the conversation that to have a conversation was a waste of time. And with great grace, she listened to this woman. It would have been so easy to get defensive. Ah, uh, it's probably good I wasn't on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Christie listened to her and then thanked her for her input and got off the phone and proceeded to share with us everything that had, that had been said. And I'm making notes, because I'm, I'm preaching on this this weekend. I'm thinking, this is great timing. <laughs> so what do you think about this? What do you think about this? You know, we giggle and stuff, but I think about faith in action. And I think about four years ago, because this was our fourth year, so four years ago in the months leading up to our very first Faith in Action weekend, I mean to tell you, there were quite a few people in the church who didn't feel that much different than she did. Their attitude was, cancel worship, you can't do that. You can't cancel worship, you can't cancel our worship services on Sunday. They were the naysayers, and they were not going to sign up, and they were convinced it was such a foolish idea that when it came time for people to start signing up and registering, that everybody would feel just like they did, that nobody would sign up to go on Faith in Action, and that they would, they would show those people who were planning Faith in Action what a foolish thing this was. And then the opportunity to sign up came in. Hundreds and hundreds of people signed up for Faith in Action. People who understood the importance of what we were trying to do. People who understood that loving God and loving neighbor take precedent. People who understood that worshiping God and honoring the Sabbath take multiple forms. And faith in action from year one was a huge success. And that very first year of faith in action, it was a little different than this year. We actually all went home, changed our clothes, and came back for the barbecue in the evening. So I was back for that barbecue in the evening, was here a couple hours. It was a beautiful night, I remembered. It was just gorgeous. And uh, it was time for me to go. So I'm walking out to my car, and there's another couple who I know, who actually knew had been two of the people who were going to have nothing to do with this, walking out to their car, which means they'd been at the barbecue, right? I hope that meant they had helped out. So they saw me. They saw me. They saw me, and the gentleman said, Stephanie, I want to talk to you. He said, I got to tell you what. He said, you know, I was one of the people who thought this was the biggest mistake. I could not believe that people would put up with not having worship on Sunday morning. But he said, you know what? He said, my Sunday school class, we made a pact. We weren't going to sign up. And then registration started, and he said, one by one. They just all started signing up to do this. So he said, we thought we'd sign up too. And then he told me about what he and, his, he and his wife had gone to do, what their assignment had been, and the interaction they had with the people that they served. And his eyes started to well up. And he got to the done to the, the part of his story, and he said, Stephanie, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. He said, I will be one of the first people to sign up next year for Faith in Action. And he was, and so was his wife. And it makes me realize how much we can learn when we will just open the door just a little bit, even grudgingly, how much we can learn and how we can grow in our faith if we're just willing to step out just a little bit. Now, I want to tell you I absolutely understand the necessity of rules. This sermon is called Breaking the Rules. That was just to get you here. <laughs> I, I understand the necessity of rules. I do. Rules. Rules we need in every area of our lives. You know, I'm not talking about laws. We need laws, too. But I'm talking about rules, those kind of underlying rules. You know, We need them in our homes. We need them in our schools. We need them in our workplaces. And we certainly need them in the church. Rules allow us to serve together with a sense of order and peace and unity. But I will say this about rules. They aren't meant to be broken arbitrarily, but they are meant to be questioned regularly. Rules are meant to be questioned regularly because when rules have been around for a while, they can be abused, they can be misunderstood, and they can take on a life of their own. As time passes, rules can become outdated, archaic, pointless, and detrimental to certain people, and that's why we need to pay attention to what the rules are that we're following. 
And as Christians, for each of us to be healthy and whole and the person God intends us to be, and for our church to be healthy and whole and the church God intends, I think every single one of us who consider ourselves to be a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to be aware of why we do what we do. We need to understand what the rules are and why we do what we do. And a couple, of, a couple of ways that you can do this, it's very, very helpful. It's I think each one of us, if we've been in the church for a while, we really do have a responsibility to have at least a basic understanding of Scripture. And if, and if you haven't ever been in Disciple Bible Study, I would heartily encourage you this fall, when it starts up again, to see if you can't make the time to do that to have this basic underlying foundational understanding of the Bible is so key. Worship will mean more to you, hymns will mean more to you, and certainly reading scripture will mean more to you. And then the other thing that I think is really imperative, if we've been in the church for a while, we really need a daily time of prayer with God. We need to be building that relationship with God on a daily basis. So I'll tell you what, as a pastor, when people have been in church for a while, as a pastor, I get concerned for anybody who's following blindly. We really need to have enough information to know what, what to question and when things need to change. But I'll tell you what bothers me more than people who follow blindly. I have a greater concern for people who have just enough knowledge to become an obstacle to themselves and to other people, like the woman who talked to Christy on the phone. She was so engrossed in her understanding of a particular rule that she was blind to all the good that happened on Faith in Action Sunday. It escaped her completely. She totally missed the holiness of the moment. And the really amazing thing is, something very similar happens in our scripture today. Jesus is back in Jerusalem. And he's at a pool called Bethesda that is surrounded by hundreds of people who are very sick. And need, and need help. And he, he takes attention of a, of a certain person who has been there for 38 years or has been sick for 38 years, and, and he goes up to him out of all the people there. He goes up to him and he says to him, do you want to be well? And this man right away starts to describe how this all works. Well, he says, you know, when the waters get disturbed, I have no one to help me get to the water first. He's explaining all the rules to the healing, you see. And what does Jesus say to him? Does he say, well, I'll hang around and help you? No, no. Does he say, better luck next time? No, 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 no. What he says is, he says, get up, take your bedroll, start walking. I mean, can you imagine this guy? He's been an invalid for 38 years. What? You want me to what? Now, wait a minute. See, you didn't hear me. First, the waters have to be disturbed. <laughs> you know, get up. So he does. He gets up. He gets up. He's healed on the spot. He gets up. He picks up his bedroll and he starts to walk. Now really, this man's been there for 38 years. People probably have noticed him. They know who he is. He's a regular, right? This is a miracle. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. Everybody there is there to be healed and all of a sudden this guy's up walking around. Oh, you'd think it'd be the most incredible celebration. You'd think people would be asking, how did this happen? What is going on? And what happens? Well, it happens to be the day of the Sabbath. And Jewish leaders stop the healed man and say, it's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bedroll around. It's against the rules. <laughs> and it's funny. It's just funny. I mean, really? 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 Are you serious? Oh my gosh, I have thought so much about this scripture. These are the rule keepers. They were so engrossed in the need to follow the rules that they were blind to the miracle. It escaped them completely. See, there was a time when I thought, when I would read the scripture, I thought that maybe they were just trying to downplay the miracle because they really didn't like Jesus anyway. But then I started thinking about this woman who called the church. I started thinking about her tunnel vision, and I started thinking about how focused she was on not breaking a rule that she genuinely missed everything else around it. And I start to wonder if it's not that they're disregarding the miracle, they genuinely don't see it. 
They're so focused on not breaking the rule that they completely miss the miracle. I'm wondering if that isn't completely possible. They totally miss the holiness of the moment. And see, that's when rules are an obstacle. When we miss the blessing in our midst, when we miss the grace of God in the moment, that's when we've got a problem. In the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 2, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. What he is saying is, the Sabbath was ma- meant to work for us. We're not meant to work for the Sabbath. We really need to be able to look at this stuff. I mean, how often do we, how often do we as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, get caught up in rules and we don't even realize we're doing it? You know, if you grew up in the church, there's, there's underlying rules that are just a part of you, that's just intrinsic. You know, you were, you were taught by your Sunday school teachers, by your parents, by your grandparents. There's stuff that we carry around. And I don't mean it's bad, but it's there. And it's so much a part of who we are, sometimes we don't even realize that when we're pushing back against something new or different, it's coming from some old rule that we really need to question, is it viable or is it not? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't. We need to be aware of the rules and why we do what we do, and we need, we need not ever to be afraid to question those rules. So, so how, do, how do we do that? When we question these rules, what, what do we have to, to line them up against to help us decide what's important and what isn't? What is the most important commandment? to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember when Jesus said that? He held the two together. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said this is the most important thing, to love God and to love neighbor. Maybe that's one of the things that we hold up against different rules that we have going on, and we see how it holds up against loving God and loving neighbor. One of the ways we love God and love neighbor every single Saturday night is through Holy Communion. And you might find this interesting, but there are a whole lot of Christians, a whole lot of disciples of Jesus Christ outside of the denomination of United Methodism who would actually tell us that every Saturday night when we serve Holy Communion, we're breaking the rules. Seriously. Every Saturday night, we are breaking the rules. Do you know why? because we don't have rules for receiving Holy Communion. And there are denominations that cannot believe that. How can that be? You can't do that. You can't do that. Don't you have to be a member of the church to receive Holy Communion? No. Well, don't you at least have to be a United Methodist to receive Holy Communion in the Methodist Church? No. Well, don't you have to do something to earn the right to receive Holy Communion? No. No, no, and no. No. This is a table of grace. This is not a table of rules. This is a table of grace, and it's a table of God's grace. And we know that in the United Methodist Church, anyone who wishes to receive the elements of bread and cup are welcome. And there are other denominations that cannot begin to imagine. I'll tell you what, on Christmas Eve, We serve Holy Communion between Christmas Eve services. I cannot tell you the number of phone calls we get on Christmas Eve from all kinds of people wanting to know if they can receive Holy Communion. And we say, absolutely. Everyone is welcome to this table. This is a table of inclusivity. This is a table for all people. Tell me, what better way to love God and love neighbor than that? And I think our understanding of Holy Communion is a way of understanding the United Methodist Church in general.